Hello, everyone, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards. In this lesson, number 173, under the topic or heading of being an effective software architect, uh, we'll see some techniques and tools for leveraging checklists to help make your development teams effective. You can get a listing of all the lessons I do in Software Architecture Monday on my website at developer2architect.com slash lessons. It's kind of interesting. Airline pilots use checklists for every single solitary flight, even the most seasoned veteran pilots. And I'm glad they do because the one time they forget to set the flaps to 10 degrees on takeoff, uh, that plane doesn't take off. Checklists are used for everything in flying. As a matter of fact, a checklist are used in the medical field as well. A fantastic book, The Checklist Manifesto by uh, Dr. Atul Gawande, uh, really describes uh, a case study of hospitals which weren't using checklists and those that were. And really, those that used the checklist reduced staph infections to near zero rates. While those hospitals that weren't using the checklists, those staph infection rates continued to increase. The power of a checklist. So one wonders, with the effectiveness of checklists, why don't we, as software developers, and software architects leverage checklists. Well, that's what I want to talk about in this lesson. How to leverage checklists, what to do and what not to do, and how to make them effective. You see, the real key to effective checklists is knowing which processes should have checklists and which ones should not. Uh, let's take a little tour and look at these. Uh, which processes should not have checklists? Not everything should be a checklist. It's, it's, you'll see in one of the tips, the pro tips at the end of this lesson. Um, but processes that have a procedural flow of dependent tasks do not belong in a checklist. Uh, this is a series of steps. And also, small, simple, well-known processes that we execute frequently without error. We're not flying airplanes, and we're not generally um, uh, in the medical field doing surgery. Um, we're developing software. Some of that software may in fact be extremely critical, or it may be a business application. And so not every procedure that we have needs a checklist. Uh, let me show you a really good example of a process that should not be a checklist. Um, so here we have the checklist uh, for uh, creating a new database table. Uh, we have to fill out the field names and types in a form. Uh, we have to fill out the request form with those database fields and types. Uh, we then obtain permission for the table creation. We submit the request form to the database group, and then we verify it once it's created. This is a great example of what not to do with a checklist. This is not a checklist. This is really a series of steps. It's a procedure we do. Look, I can't verify that, that the table was created correctly until I obtain permission for the form. Well, I can't obtain permission for this new database table unless, of course, I determine the fields and the types. <laughs> so this does not belong in a checklist. Okay. But what stuff does belong in a checklist? What processes should have checklists? Well, processes that tend to be error prone or those kind of processes that have steps that are frequently missed or skipped G. We don't have any of those in software development, do we? <laughs> of course we do. Those things that are error prone are exactly the kind of things we want checklists for. Also, some of the processes that we do that tend to be error prone, but don't have any dependent tasks. There's no procedural order to these. So let me show you four key checklists to consider starting out with, or maybe just ending with, 
Um, and these are ones that I have found very, very uh, useful. Uh, the first is probably the most basic checklist, our source code completion or our code review checklist. Um, this checklist not only helps document and define what we mean by that definition of done. Oh, I'm all done with the source code. But also allows us to really focus on those things that aren't automated. And that's really one of the keys. Uh, we don't want to put things in a checklist that we can automate. Um, so uh, coding standards that we personally have that aren't in some of our Lint tools, uh, frequently overlooked items. I love adding those. These checklists just continue to grow. Um, application specific standards that we use on our particular project or special instructions. Uh, a, a good example on our team. We never ever remove, remove a field or an attribute from an entity. Rather, we decrement it or deprecate it and add another one. Uh, this is a special rule we have on the team. Uh, these are things to add in these kind of checklists to make sure that when a developer says, I'm done, that they've gone through all of these particular steps. Now, another really basic checklist that I'm sure you're going to laugh at, of course, is the unit and functional testing checklist. Uh, but here, what I try to focus on are those unusual things. The things when we get in a rush that we forget about. Uh, the unusual or extreme test cases. Uh, let's say I'm working on a bank transfer system and I'd like to transfer uh, 4,000 US into Zimbabwe dollars. Give that a try sometime and you will see the overflows that occur because that's many billions and billions of dollars, <laughs> Zimbabwe dollars. Um, min and max value ranges. I, I love doing a buy for negative 200 shares. It's one of the my favorite test cases. Um, does it turn it into a sell? Because if we're buying negative shares, then aren't we in effect selling them? <laughs> and there's sometimes some unusual things that happen here. Um, so these, you know, special characters, some of the stuff that may seem obvious, but we tend to get skipped. They, we tend to skip them if we get really busy. Now, <clears throat> let me ask you this. Uh, obviously, it has to be a rhetorical question because I'm in a video here. <laughs> what is your opinion about the most error-prone part of software development? I know my answer. And that happens to be when we deploy and release software. I don't know what it is, but it worked on my machine, yet we seem to always crash production. We can't ever seem to release software. What a perfect place, everyone, for a checklist. If anything, this should be your primary checklist. Every time you deploy, look for errors, things that are lost, and then add those to the checklist. Uh, configuration changes, things we happen to change on the server in our regression environment, and we forget to apply those changes in production. Uh, Third-party libraries that we added uh, about a month ago, and I'm sorry, I just forgot all about those. Uh, maybe it's database migration script or database updates that we forgot about. Anything that's error prone, add to this checklist. And over time, uh, your releases will be flawless because it's usually things we forgot about, things we missed, things we skipped. Now, the other checklist I've leveraged a lot, and especially in uh, clients that have a lot of attrition or are building up a team, is a developer onboarding checklist. How many times <clears throat> have you become a you know, you join a team as a developer and you do something like like remove an attribute uh, in an entity object and somebody comes over and yells at you. It's like, what? No one's using it. I, I just removed it. We never remove attributes. We mark them as deprecated and then add them. Oh, no one told me. 
Yes. Um, how many errors have happened, mistakes, because no one told me about that? These are the things to put in that developer onboarding checklist. Team logistics, uh, things like uh, project walkthroughs, architecture walkthroughs, um, instructions for configuration and setup can go directly in here, except I would say I would have a link. <laughs> These are some really key checklists. Now, let me share with you some pro tips about making checklists work. The first pro tip is this. Don't worry about stating something obvious in a checklist. It turns out, and this is documented um, very well in Dr. Atul Gawande's book, The Checklist Manifesto, that it's usually the obvious and simple things that are skipped. Yeah, the hard things we constantly think about, it's the easy stuff we forget. So don't worry about putting something really obvious. Um, don't forget about, uh, don't absorb any exceptions. Well, duh. Whoops. How many times have been on a hurry, in a hurry, on Friday, right before the demo at the end of the iteration, and you forgot about that exception. <laughs> um, here's a really great pro tip. Keep your checklists as small as as possible. They don't need to include everything. Just those things that are important, those things that are skipped. Now, the exception here, I would say, would probably be the release uh, uh, into production checklist. That would continue probably to grow. <laughs> um, but the idea is if checklists are too big, developers will not use them. So try to keep them as small as possible. Also, Make sure that anything you have in a checklist, constantly say to yourself, can I automate this? Because if you can, then it shouldn't be in the checklist. And finally, uh, the last pro tip, collaborate as an architect with your development team on checklists. Don't create a checklist and then communicate to your development team. Here's the checklist, you must follow this. Rather, talk with your development team. Say, here's a checklist I'm thinking of. What all do you think? Oh, I'm glad you have number one on there. <laughs> we forget that all the time. Uh, but the second item, no, that's not a problem for our team. I would remove that. But there's another thing we skip. Can you add this to the checklist? And by collaborating, developers will be more likely to actually use the checklist. And the last tip, think of checklists like beer. You have a hard day at work. You go to the pub. What do you do? Well, you have a beer. You start to feel a little better. Um, yeah, I'll have a couple more. Now you're getting really talkative. You've kind of forgotten about the day and how many problems you've had. So what happens? You order a couple or more. And pretty soon you're closing the pub and then you'll be in trouble. <laughs> Don't go overboard and make every process a checklist. You will find, I can promise you, that done properly, checklists will make your team more effective. And like beer, we start to say, well, if one beer makes me feel good, six will make me feel great. And no, it actually doesn't work that way. It's the law of diminishing returns. And checklists follow that same law. So keep them small, uh, keep them few, only those that are critical, things that we constantly skip, those kind of error prone situations. All right, so this has been lesson 173, uh, leveraging checklists, uh, yet one tool we have in our architect's tool belts to help make development teams more effective. So stay tuned in two more Mondays for the next lesson in Software Architecture Monday.